Chapter 31 Bella, I whispered, looking down at her ashen face, an angel in repose. Bella. And then the darkness took us, a blinding fury of agony and torment, dragging me down, down towards the black, starless midnight within the eye of the storm. My hands were still moving, up, down, up, down, continuing their desperate supplications over Bella's chest, begging, pleading, beseeching her heart to beat again. And as I worked relentlessly within the blackness to bring her back to me, it was the images of my own life that flashed in front of my sightless eyes, even though I was not the one who was truly dying. Bella's laughter, ringing across the waves, light and untroubled. She shrieks as a fish touches her leg, and then puts her snorkel back into place, and floats on the surface of the water. The sun glistens off the skin on her back, and below her I can see the tranquil movement and multicolored palette of the life of the reef. I am anxious, nervous about being at such a distance from her, but the sea life is repelled by my presence, and I so want her to have this experience. She has seen so little of the world, and there are so many wonders I want to share with her. I feel a blanket of profound happiness wrap itself around me. Inside the house, I am tormented by longing. Her hair, her skin, her scent, even the sound of her voice, all ignite a fire of yearning in me. I am enraptured with her, and strung so tightly by my belief that I could not touch her and keep her safe. But out here, I feel weightless, like I could fly with joy, suspended with disbelief that she was actually married to me, that she is mine, and will always be together. Her head breaks the surface, eyes dancing, and her hand beckons me. She wants me to come to her. I dive into the water, a meteor towards the sun. I will always come to you, Bella. I hold fast to a tree a few miles out, far enough that they won't sense my presence, but close enough for me to hear their minds. My eyes are pitch black, denied to reduce my shame if I dare visit. They do not sit together, this day, exactly two years since I left them. Esme is in the front room. She fingers old photos of me and Carlyle before she was with us. She wonders, as she always has, if it was her presence that upset the delicate balance of our relationship. How badly I wanted to tell her that that was not true, that it was never her, always me. How much I wanted to feel her soft arms around me, inhale the familiar scent of her hair. If she told me everything was okay, I wonder, would it be? Carlyle sits in the back bedroom, my old room, so long untouched. It was now packed up along with the rest of the house. They will no longer linger here, no longer wait for me to return. They've stayed too long already. His thoughts are tinged with bitterness, despair, regret, but more than anything else, loneliness. The same bone-deep, wrenching loneliness that I felt without him. Carlyle's head snaps up suddenly. Edward? He draws in a sharp breath. Edward? I release the tree, turn and run away, willing my legs to move against my emotions. I cannot go back. I cannot sully them with my presence. For me, the monster has won, and so I can never go home. Rosalie and Emmett stand at the altar. I can feel Carlyle's arm pressed against mine as we stand together next to them. He sighs quietly, and I can sense just a little of the heavy guilt he carries slip away as he watches Rose's happiness in this moment. Rosalie turns her head slightly and smiles at me. She is glowing today. The bitterness and resentment that often plague her thoughts is gone for once. She is truly as lovely in this moment as I have ever seen her beautiful inside as well as out. Love has made her even more beautiful. Emmett, seeing her smile, follows her eyes to my face and lifts his hand briefly to grip my shoulder. A brother, I think, smiling back at him. I am less alone now. A memory I didn't even know I had. I am a child. I look down at my own face, 
young, unknowing, reflecting back at me in a small pool of still water. I am searching for a colorful stone to give to my mother. How much I want to please her. Two emerald gems sparkle up at me, and I realize it's my eyes, my human eyes. I reach into the water, spreading a million small ripples through the image, and my face, that face, disappears, forever. It's dawn of a long night after Jasper has confessed to killing another human. It is someone we know, a neighbor, and also a patient of Carlyle's. So we prepare our hasty departure. Jasper sits alone, his face in his hands. He can feel Alice's heartbreak, the disappointment she tries so hard to hide, her anger at herself for not warning him in time, and he hates himself for it. He despises his own weakness, and yet resents that our lifestyle makes him feel like a failure. He glances up, looking for me. I turn towards him, smiling gently. I understand what it feels like to disappoint the people who love you. Jasper has grown closest to me, aside from Alice. He is so reserved, so private, that I think he actually appreciates not being able to hide anything from me. I'm sorry, he thinks. I shake my head. We have all told him already that he doesn't need to keep apologizing. We support him, no matter what. He is part of our family. But I know he doesn't feel that way, and I secretly wonder if he ever will. Seeing a vision of him fleeing the house, Alice sits down and wraps her arms around him, refusing to move until he finally gives in, embracing her desperately. As the dawn light begins to glow on the underside of the forest, they sit together, clinging to each other, supporting each other, anchored by forgiveness and the kind of love I am sure at the time I will never know. We move silently around them as we pack up our lives, leaving again. Bella sits on the black couch in my room, grimacing at her math homework. She smooths her hair back with her fingers, and her teeth press into her lower lip. I sigh involuntarily at the sight of it. She glances up and smiles. I love you, she says quietly. I close my eyes and let the words wash over me. I will never get tired of hearing those words from her lips. When I open my eyes, she is looking down at her book again. She hums quietly to herself, and it is her lullaby. Suddenly, I know what I'm going to give her for her birthday, only a couple of weeks away. I hear Alice squeal quietly downstairs. Perfect, Edward, she thinks. I smile. I already know some of the other songs I will record for her, a piece of myself to keep with her for the hours I cannot be there. I go over and take her hand, pulling her to her feet and pressing her body to mine. Her heart thunders, and I can feel her pulse everywhere she touches me. As I hold her close, love fills me to the core, and I know I will always want to be with her, be at her side. I do not see the dark clouds gathering on the horizon. Carlyle places a small box into my hand. The opal and diamonds of my mother's ring glimmer up at me. I know he has been holding on to this, waiting to give it to me when he thinks I am more in control. He thinks he has hidden these thoughts from me. He doesn't yet fully comprehend the pervasiveness of my ability. I am embarrassed and scared to tell him that almost nothing he holds in his mind or heart is private anymore. I am afraid he will resent me for it. He touches the ring. You may need this some day, he thinks. My fingers clench around the box, and I look up at him incredulously. Are you crazy? I snarl. I will never need this. No one will ever love me that way. I hurl the box across the room, and it smashes against the far wall, leaving a dent and splintering into several pieces. I feel a flash of shame as I realize it was the original box, and that Carlyle had gone to some trouble to retrieve it. Now it was just another irreplaceable piece of my human life, broken and forever lost. I stand up and look into the mirror over the bureau, at my wild eyes and unfamiliar face. 
The fire in my throat continues its constant, torturous burn. No one could ever love this. My own mother would hate me if she wasn't dead. I slammed my fist into the mirror, shattering it. No, she wouldn't, Carlyle thinks gently. He sits, waiting, patient, always so patient. I find this patience both infuriating and humbling. I turn to look at him. So much concern for me, so much affection. He loves me already, and I know I'm beginning to love him. My mood softens, and I inhale deeply. A human has walked too close to our small house, and the scent hits me unexpectedly, intoxicating, stoking the fire. Carlyle notes the scent as well, and I feel a glimmer of hope. Please, Carlyle, I whisper. The burn is unbearable. He sighs. He stands and walks over to pick up the ring from the fractured box. I'll hold on to this for a little while longer, he thinks, looking at me. We will go hunt in the mountains. My teeth clench together as my mood turns to sudden fury. Denied again. I whirl and kick the dresser, smashing in the drawers. And Carlyle waits, patient. Alice and I sit together by the river, in the silence born of long familiarity. I've returned home briefly so Bella can shower and get ready for school. It is sunny today, so I won't be able to attend, but I will watch. I can't stand to have her out of my sight now. The others have gone away hunting, but I am terrified to leave Bella so soon after my return. I cannot even contemplate ever leaving again at this point. Alice has stayed back as well, saying she will keep me company, but I know she is also hesitant to be away from Bella after so many months without her company. Glancing at her out of the corner of my eye, I reach down and flick a spray of water at her. Envisioning my move, she jumps away. I grab at her, but she sees my plan and jumps nimbly onto the rocks. She reaches down to splash me but I read her intentions and jump up over her head, landing on the rock behind her. My arm shoots out, but she dances to the side, laughing. Then she steps on a rock that proves unsteady, and in the fraction of a second it takes her to adjust, I leap onto her, and we crash into the river behind us. She squirms and kicks, and mentally curses me for getting her outfit wet, as we twist under the water. Finally, she kicks away, leaping out of the water onto the grass. I jump out after her, landing in a somersault and rolling onto my back, the sky cool blue above me. She slides over and props herself up on top of me, a gentle weight against my chest. She reaches up and pushes the wet hair out of my eyes, smoothing it back gently. Sunlight dances against our skin reflecting prisms in the drops of water that glitter on us. I'm glad you're back, she thinks. Me too, I whisper, smiling. Bella's scream of agony by the hand of James, shredding me into a million pieces. I roar with wild fury at the scene, and familiar hands grapple with me, restraining, comforting. Someone whispers reassuringly in my ear, but all I can see is the images from the video. Bella's face contorted in pain. I will never forget. Carlyle and Esme's amber eyes glow up at me from amidst a sea of humans. Carlyle watches intently, his face alive with fervent pride, as I receive my first medical degree. My son, he thinks. My son. My mother sings to me softly a familiar song from my childhood that fills me with longing and loss. Her voice is rough, her breathing labored. I don't open my eyes, unable to face the death in the hospital around us. I want to go home, I think. I just want to go home. My mother gently presses a cool cloth to my burning face. Bella looks up at me, and amazingly, her face is alight with wonder and joy. You love me? She breathes, and I am electrified by the trust and tenderness in her voice. Truly, I do, I say softly, smiling, and her expression is luminous, happy, 
eyes soft pools of brown chocolate, and then I see those same brown eyes looking up at me from a small, perfect, newborn face, hope and life held gently in my hands. Renesme, I whisper, the darkness receding slightly as I clutch to the memory of her face. Up, down, up, down. Renesme, I repeated her name again and again. Renesme, I said her name like a prayer, a chant to the gods above. I said her name for the mother she would never know, for the father who would now surely fade away, for everything she embodied of me and Bella, the best and brightest parts of each of us, a precious legacy of our love, and everything she was of herself, now and in the future, and what she would be to those who remained to love her, Renesme, a flicker of life beneath my hands, the muted whisper of a response. I paused, uncertain, terrified, and then, within a blazing dawn, the darkness was swept away by the creation of a single, brilliant heartbeat.